Okay, so welcome everybody uh, to the One World Probability Seminar. So um, today we will have um, two uh, related talks uh, on the, by um, Dirk Erhard and Amor Val Gabel. And um, so they're not going to be a uh, strictly related, although they were going to be in a subjects which are more or less related, but they are going to be independent talks, not like uh, uh, last week uh, where we had uh, one uh, introductory talk first and then a more advanced uh, talk. Um, so let me just uh, remind you that um, we are uh, broadcasting uh, on, on the YouTube channel of the One World Probability Seminar. The, the, the seminars in case you have um, uh, some troubles with the with your connection with slow connections uh, you can uh, you, you you can use the, the YouTube uh, channel which is uh, has some uh, buffering and uh, uh, works better with the unstable connections also if you miss uh, uh, one definition uh, and you want to go back and, and see it, you can go to the YouTube channel and, 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 and take it and take a look there. So our first uh, speaker is going to be Dirk Erhard from the Federal University of Bahia. He's going to talk about uh, 2D anisotropic KPC and stationarity. Okay. So uh, thanks, Dr. Milton, and uh, thanks for the, for the invite. It's an honor to be here to speak here. So this talk will be about the KPZ equation, and it's a joint work with um, Giuseppe Canizzaro from Warwick University and Fabio Tonelli from Vienna University. Or at least kind of the main thing I will talk about is the joint work with the, these two guys. Uh, however, I also included Philip Schönbauer, who was a PhD student and now left academia at, uh, at London, because uh, part of our work is really based on the joint work we did with Giuseppe and Philip. Okay. So, yeah, I will talk about the KPC equation and I'm, I guess, okay, some of you maybe are quite expert in this equation, but uh, maybe a lot of you have maybe seen the equation, uh, but really don't remember what it's all about. And so the first part of the talk, I will really spend trying to motivate the equation where it comes from. Uh, then I will talk about, uh, well, the first things you can say about the KPC equation, then I will come to what we actually did. And well, one way to introduce the KPC equation as well. So one of the book, book, uh, big fundamental questions in probability theory is about universality, right? And so essentially, you want to know if kind of a big class of models converge to the same limit, because this would allow you to instead focus maybe only on the limit instead of the specific model attack. And um, well, one of the first things we see already during our first course on probability theory is uh, probably this uh, central limit theorems for random variables, which I wrote down here, but which probably everybody here knows, which essentially says that if you have a sequence of IID random variables with second moments, then a certain rescale sum converges to a normal distribution. Yeah? And um, so this kind of introduces Gaussian universality, at least a Gaussian universality for a sequence of random numbers. So maybe in our second course or third course of probability theory, we kind of see a generalization of this, which is instead of looking at a sequence of random numbers, a sequence of random functions or, or trajectories, right? Which is often called, or usually called Tosca theory, but which again is a central limit theorem type of result. So in this case, uh, instead of a sequence x1, x2, xn, you would take a simple random walk with increments i, i, d have second moments. Yeah? And then given this random walk, you can define a random function. So uh, do the usual thing. You look at times of order n times t, you recenter and divide by square root of n. Yeah? So then this object depends on t, so it defines a random function. And it turns out that this random function converges in a certain sense to Brownian motion. So again, to a, to a Gaussian distribution. Yeah? So these are probably two results we see during our studies. And then, well, you can ask yourself, can you push this further? Do you see Gaussianity in more general contexts, in more complicated contexts? For instance, I mean, the first result, again, is about a sequence of random numbers. The second is of a sequence of random functions. 
So what about sequence of random fields or space-time space -time functions? Yeah. And it turns out that again, there the Gaussian, Gaussian distribution pops up again. Yeah. And uh, well, instead of formulating completely general result, I wouldn't know probably how to do it. Let me introduce an example where you see Gaussianity appearing and which then allows me smoothly to go to the KPZ equation. So now what I would look at, would like to look at is a random function that depends on space and time. And um, a famous example for this is what we call the simple symmetric exclusion process. Yeah, so simple symmetric exclusion process. Yeah. And essentially the idea is you stay on the d-dimensional lattice. Yeah. And now you put on the d-dimensional lattice a bunch of random walks. Now these random walks, well, behave as random walks too, so they jump around. And they jump around essentially independently of each other. However, they respect the exclusion rule, simply meaning that two particles are never allowed to be the same side at the same time. So in a sense, all the random walkers behave independently of each other, except if they're nearest neighbors. If they're nearest neighbors, then they try or then they will avoid each other. Yeah. So many of you may know this, this process, but still I want to clarify. So essentially, if you look at this process in dimension one, yeah, in particular, the exclusion rule implies that at time zero, at each point, there can be either zero particles or one particle. So let's say at this side, there's zero particles, there's no particle. Maybe at this side, there's also no particle. But maybe here with a particle, which I draw with a full circle, maybe here's also a particle, maybe there's a particle here, but no particle here, no particle here, particle here, and part no particle here. So what I was saying is that uh, each of these particles now wants to, uh, wants to evolve according to a simple random walk. So in particular, opa, scoop, set, sorry. So if you look, for instance, at this guy, yeah, then you can think that uh, on the edge to the left and the edge to the right, they're sitting in exponential clock. And this guy simply waits until one of these two clocks rings and then it will jump uh, in the according direction. So if the exponential clock to the right rings first, so then this guy would simply jump here and the new configuration, the new configuration would be something like this. So now we have a particle here. So this guy here in the middle wants to do the same, right? So he will look at the two exponential clocks that are attached here, waits until one of these two clock rings, and whenever the first rings, he wants to jump across this edge. So let's say the clock to the left rings first, so the attempt would be really to jump over the side or on, uh, on the side. However, now the exclusion rule simply forbids this jump. Yeah. So this jump is not performed. And that's the simple symmetric exclusion process. Yeah. And uh, so one thing that we know about the simple symmetric exclusion process is that it has an invariant measure on the row, which is a product Bernoulli of a fixed parameter rho, where say to be interesting, rho is strictly between zero and one. Of course, it's rho zero or one, that's also an invariant measure, but it's a relatively boring one because either you have no particles at all or everything is stuck with particles. So then the exclusion rule for, would forbid any movement. Okay. So if you think a bit about it, so if you denote by eta the exclusion process, right? So what does this guy do? Essentially, to each point of ZD, it assigns, it assigns the value zero or one. Yeah. So this would be an example maybe of a random space-time function. And then again, you can ask yourself, oh, I mean, I know Donsker's theory, so do I have something similar to Donsker or some kind of a central li limit theorem type of result? And the answer is yes. Yeah. So, so one way of formulating would be maybe like this. I don't know. So here I denote by eta the exclusion process with a symmetric transition kernel with suff sufficiently moments. Then what I do, I take a smooth compactly support function f and I define a function of y as follows. So let's, let's see. So here we have the function f, right? Considered as a space point x divided by n. Now I'm assuming that f is compactly supported. 
So let's assume this subplot is size one. So this means f of x divided by n is zero if x divided by n is larger than one, right? So essentially this con condition f imposes that the number of terms in the sum is of the order n to the d. So then I have this factor one over n to the d half, so I really divide by the square root of the number of points I have here. So that's really the typical central limit theorem scale. Yeah? And last but not least, what I do, I weight this function f uh, with the exclusion process where time is accelerated by n squared and where this recentering that I always set in the central limit theory. Yeah? So what we can see here is really some kind of diffusive scaling, right? Time and space are scaled diffusively. And the result is that this yn converges in a certain topology, which doesn't matter, to a Gaussian, Gaussian process again, which is called Orange and Wundberg process, um, but which doesn't really matter for the sake of the talk. So again, kind of now we are kind of at the most complicated level where we see, again, in the limit, a Gaussian process. And this kind of shows, of course, that the Gaussian universality class is big. So now you can ask yourself, exist, does there exist another universality class? And how stable is this Gaussian universality class? In the sense that if I would perturb this process just a teeny tiny little bit, I mean, if the Gaussian universality class would be stable, which is a reasonable assumption, then a small perturbation of this model doesn't change really the limit. Yeah, maybe it changes some small details, but not really the Gaussianity. And uh, where can you perturb here? Well, so what we were assuming is that we have here a symmetric uh, transition kernel. So, I mean, naively, what should happen if instead of something symmetric, we have something that is not quite symmetric, no? but almost symmetric, then the limit should be really the same, right? So what you now can look at is really as an exclusion, at an exclusion process that is a teeny tiny asymmetry that vanishes within the limit and the limit should, be really, should literally be the same, right? I mean, this would be kind of a reasonable thing. However, what turns out is if the asymmetry of this order, one over square root of n, actually, then this is not true. So even though the asymmetry really vanishes in the limit, so, I mean, the model should be related to the, to the symmetric exclusion process, the limit is really fundamentally different. It's not Gaussian anymore. Yeah. And a similar phenomena can be observed also in other models. So the exclusion process is not uh, the unique model here. So I cite some here, but they're really not important. So the only thing is really that um, there's a class of models where the limit is not Gaussian anymore. Yeah. And so what I mean here with uh, asymmetry of order one over square root of n, well, if, you, if we go back to this picture of the exclusion process, right, let's say we have particle here, particle here, no particle here, maybe particle here. So then I was saying, well, this guy, I mean, he behaves like a simple random walk. So in particular there, let's say in the nearest neighbor case, two exponential clocks attached to these both edges. And one thing I was not mentioning, but I was implicitly assuming that they have the same rate, let's say rate one. And this guy also rate one. Well, the way I can put an asymmetry here is if I increase this rate set by a tiny little bit. So that's what I mean with asymmetry. Yeah? Okay. And kind of the thing is that um, it's not only that I'm not Gaussian anymore, but um, I kind of end up with some kind of a nonlinear model. And this nonlinear model is called KPC equation. So this asymmetry induces some kind of nonlinearity. Yeah? And so that's maybe a justification why it is interesting to look at this KPC equation because it can appear under perturbations of otherwise Gaussian models. Okay. So let's look at the KPC equation. So I will slowly explain it because not everybody here is aware about this equation. So it's this equation. So what do we have here? So the unknown is a function h, yeah, that depends on space and time, uh, t and x. Yeah. And what this equation says is that the time derivative of this function is the sum of three terms. So what are these terms? I mean, here we have, on the one hand, a Laplacian term. We have a noise term. And here we have some kind of a nonlinearity, right? I mean, 
because the gradient is there twice in this inner product, so it's essentially something like gradient squared. So it's a nonlinearity. Okay. So let's think about all of these three terms separately. So let's start with the Laplacian. So what is the effect of the Laplacian? If you know a bit about PDEs, then you are well aware of it. So the effect of Laplacian is the following. Let's say our solution looks kind of rough at a certain time. It looks something like this. And now you kind of add the Laplacian to the equation. Then the Laplacian has a tendency to make the solution more smooth. So the Laplacian has a smoothing effect. So it would, I don't know, maybe the solution would look something like this. It's maybe uh, exaggerated, yeah? Uh, but it has more or less this effect. If you know a little bit about PDEs, then, uh, well, you're aware of it. If not, well, then maybe think about um, the transition probability of Brownian motion. Yeah? It's one over, I don't know, two, one over square root of two pi t exponential of minus x squared divided by two t. If t is positive, I mean, that's a perfectly smooth function, right? I mean, it's, uh, in space is a C infinity function and in time is also it's nicely differentiable as long as t is not zero. Yeah. And now if you think about it, I mean, what kind of equation does the transition probability of Brown motion satisfy? It really satisfies this equation, right? Where I started, I mean, if you look at this at time zero, well, essentially, uh, at x equal to zero, the limit, or the, the value is essentially infinity, and otherwise it's zero, yeah? So the, the transition property of Brownian motion essentially satisfies this equation. And what you can see here, so we have this Dirac delta here, which is not smooth at all. However, we have a Laplacian here, and uh, it turns out that for positive times, the solution is perfectly smooth. That's a way of seeing the smoothing effect of the Laplacian from a probabilistic point of view. Okay. So this is a Laplacian. So then we have the noise term here, the Xi, and the Xi here is a space-time white noise. So what's a space-time white noise? It's a Gaussian field, it's a Gaussian object. It's centered, and uh, it has kind of trivial correlations in space-time. So with this, I mean, with this, I mean that the um, usual way of formulating is like this. The expectation of Xi of Tx, Xi of Sy is delta of Ts, delta of xy, yeah? So essentially it's a field that's completely decorrelated. Yeah? So one way of maybe picturing it is that, well, you're in space-time, and now to each point of space-time, you attach a mean zero Gaussian random variable, and all these Gaussian random variables um, are independent. So from a probabilistic point of view, it's a very nice object actually to work with. If you think about it from an analytic point of view, it's uh, maybe not so nice to work with because, well, I mean, the probability that the Gaussian random variable is larger than, say, 10 trillion, small but positive, and is smaller than minus 10 trillion, is small but still positive. So if you now imagine a very tiny box in space-time, how many points do you have there? Well, uncountably many. And so now you have uncountably Gaussian random variables, and each of them has a chance to be larger than 10 trillion, even though the chance is tiny. But they're independent. I mean, this will happen infinitely often. Yeah. Though, from an analytical point of view, this field looks quite irregular, actually. Okay, so that's the white noise. And the last but not least, uh, we have this nonlinearity here. So there are two terms here, essentially. We have the gradient of H. So remember that the gradient of H um, at a given point x shows in the direction of the strongest increase of the function. So in other words, the gradient is a function of the slope, right? So this nonlinearity here really is a function, it's a nonlinear function of the slope. And this q, what is this q here? The q is a d by d matrix. So in dimension one, q would be a number, so it can be absorbed into the lambda. But in dimension two and high, it's a, it's a proper matrix. It's kind of um, modulates the slope dependence. That's what it does. Okay. Okay, so that's the KPZ equation. Um, again, so this new would be the smoothing mechanism, right? So larger than new here, uh, the stronger the effect of the Laplace and the stronger the uh, smoothing mechanism. Q, as I said, modulates the slope dependence. 
D is the strength of the noise, right? I mean, if the D is very large, then the noise becomes very important, and the lambda is the strength of the nonlinearity. Okay. So for what I'm doing now, um, I don't want to play with new and D, so I will simply fix them, where new will be equal to one half and D equal to one. And kind of the only variable that we really want to have here is the lambda, besides the Q, of course. Yeah. So from now on, from now on, I will assume that nu is equal to one half and t is equal to one. So these are parameters we don't want to play with. Okay. So that's the KPZ equation. And naturally, the first thing you want to do when you have an equation, you want to solve the equation, right? You want to solve the equation, and maybe study first properties of its solution. But as I was mentioning already, essentially there's a problematic term here. So in a sense, the problem is here that this C is not very smooth. Yeah, it's not very smooth. So if there would be a solution, the solution H would not be very smooth. And it turns out that this term here is not really well defined. Yeah. So one way of picturing it is that, well, here I, I stole a um, simulation of white noise in 1D. Yeah, so you can really see how irregular it is. And next to huge points can be tiny points or tiny values. Yeah, and well, here you still see the discreteness of it. I mean, this thing is still way too smooth for actual white noise. But what it kind of implies is that, uh, well, when we want to prove existence of solution, we usually use uh, analytical techniques. And this really means that this can impose potentially some problems. And that's actually really the case. So it turns out that uh, this, the equation is analytically ill posed in any dimensions. And you can kind of guess this a little bit by looking just at the linear equation. Yeah? If you look at the linear equation, one thing you can do is you can kind of get, or actually you can calculate, the regularity of the solution. Yeah? And it turns out that H has this kind of Hölder regularity. So in dimension one, this would be one half. Actually, it's, um, it's this thing minus. So it's a little bit less than this. So in dimension one, it would be almost one half further. By dimension two, it would be uh, already of negative regularity. And the higher the dimension, the worse it is. Yeah? And now, of course, if you have a linear equation, a nonlinear equation, Usually, you can't expect that the nonlinear equation is more smooth, smooth than the linear one. And then it turns out that it's not clear actually how to define this. So, that's the result of analysis. Ah, so, recall that if d is equal to one, the regularity is essentially one half. So, the gradient would have regularity minus one half. And then there's a result from analysis which tells you that you can't square two objects in general that have a negative regularity. Yeah. So that's kind of the bad news that formally this equation is not completely well posed. Yeah. So uh, one way of around this is, of course, uh, you look at regularization, then then you remove the regularization, then you study the the, the limiting object. Okay. Okay. So let's continue. So okay. So let's forget about this issue that is not uh, well posed. But at the end of the day, we need to look at the regularized version of it and remove the regularization. So what kind of properties could you study about this equation? Well, there are several things you could study. One thing that we were interested in is in large space, large, uh, large time scales. Yeah? And what we would like to know is if the nonlinearity is relevant or not. Yeah? So you remember when I introduced the KPZ equation, I was saying that it also comes from kind of the weakly asymmetric exclusion process where the asymmetry is of order one over squared of n. And this induces a nonlinearity. But now I told you that nonlinearity is actually not well defined. So one thing that could happen is that formally the equation is well as it stands, the nonlinear equation, but in truth, the nonlinearity is not really there. And so what we really would like to know is if, if the nonlinearity really is there or not. Does it change? qualitative behavior of the model or not. Yeah. And what's the first step? How can you go about it? Well, the first thing you can do is you look at the linear equation, right? You first study the linear equation. Um, you study maybe some observables, and then you compare them to the nonlinear equation. And the step zero, essentially, what you can do is you can ask yourself, oh, does there exist a space time scaling 
under which the Zilli equation is invariant? Yeah. If so, what happens to the nonlinear equation under this space-time scaling? And maybe I can deduce some properties from that. And that's what you really can do is, so it turns out if you look at this scaling, so you divide time by epsilon square, space by epsilon, so it's diffusive scaling, and you multiply this function by epsilon to the one minus d over two, then it turns out that the linear equation is really scale invariant. So this h epsilon in law at least satisfies again the linear equation. Yeah? And so just a remark, I mean, this is really large space time scales, right? If epsilon goes to zero, t over epsilon square goes to infinity, and x over epsilon also goes to infinity, so we really look at large space time scales. Okay, and now you can plug this in into the nonlinear equation, ask yourself, well, how does the scaling behave respect to the nonlinear equation? And it turns out it's like this, so it's a cal the calculation you can do. So what we see here is in front of the Laplacian, there's nothing. In front of the noise, there's also nothing. And this is not surprising, because the linear equation is invariant under that scaling. However, in front of the nonlinearity, there's something. Yeah? And so this something now we can try to analyze. So we can now try to work out uh, the exponent. So it's d over two, uh, d minus two over two. So for d equal to one, this would be minus one half, right? For d equal to one. For d equal to two, it would be zero. And for d at least three or larger, it is something positive. Yeah. So essentially, you have three different behaviors, right? So if dimension would be one, this prefactor here formally converges. Well, this prefactor converges to infinity. If d would be at least three, this prefactor really goes to zero. And if d is equal to two, well, then nothing really happens. I mean, this scaling, the nonlinear equation is also scaling environment. Yeah. And this essentially suggests the following: that the nonlinearity is relevant in dimension one, right? Because this epsilon factor here diverges. At large space times get the nonlinearity becomes more and more important. It's irrelevant for higher dimensions at least three, and well, we don't really know in dimension two. Okay. And well, now you can try to prove this. And essentially it has been established in some cases in dimension one and the at least three. So dimension one, well, I mean, first of all, there has been quite some work in the recent years about it. And it was shown that actually you can define the equation on small space time scales doing some kind of renormalization. But if you look at large space-time scales, uh, then it turns out that another object appears, the so-called KPC fixed point. And it also turns out that actually this diffusive scaling is not the, the right scaling. You need the use scaling that's called one, two, three scaling. And under this scaling, um, this H epsilon actually converges. It's a very recent result. And to something, yeah. And this shows really that in D equal to one, the, the nonlinear tree is indeed relevant. Yeah, so the limit is not Gaussian. If D is at least three, and if the matrix Q is some tiny beta times the identity matrix, yeah, then it turns out that the nonlinearity is also not relevant. So that's something we know. So there have been a series of work for this specific Q for a small beta that show that the nonlinearity is not relevant. For more general Q, well, we don't really know. So mathematically, it's quite tricky. And kind of this leaves open the, this marginal dimension d equal to two, and that's what I would like to talk about now. Yeah. So that's a well, semi-famous conjecture, maybe Rolf's conjecture at the beginning of the 90s. And he conjectured that in the two-dimensional case there are two regimes. One that he calls the isotropic regime, isotropic KPZ, and another one that he calls the unisotropic regime, unisotropic KPZ. And he conjectures that the distinguishing features between these two regimes is the determinant of Q. So if the determinant is positive, we're in the isotropic regime. Yeah. So determinant positive in particular includes the case where Q is the identity matrix. Yeah. And in this case, what he conjectures that there are model independent exponents, zeta and alpha, such that this happens. 
So such that first of all, the variance of h of t zero minus h of zero zero is of the order t to the two zeta for large t, where the zeta is more or less 2.04, but there's some simulations that kind of exclude that it's exactly 2.04. And if you now fix time and look at space, so the variance of h t x minus h t y, then the variance should be of the order x minus y to the two alpha as the distance between x and y increases. Yeah? For alpha more or less 0 0.39. Yeah? And so this really shows that, if this would be true at least, uh, that the non linearity is relevant because in the linear case where lambda is 0, zeta and alpha would be 0 as well. Okay, so that's the isotropic case. The other regime the anisotropic regime. And this is the case we did where the determinant is non-positive. So in particular, this regime also includes the case for Q is zero, yeah? which would be the linear equation. And what he conjectures is that zeta and alpha are zero in the sense that the variance in time and in space, they both grow logarithmically. Yeah? And this again is, you can check this, the same behavior as for the linear equation. Yeah? So essentially, if you want to do math, I mean, the two things that you would like to show is that in the isotropic regime, as you look at the scaling I presented, uh, the nonlinearity becomes more and more relevant as epsilon goes to zero. Whereas in the anisotropic regime, kind of uh, the effect of the nonlinearity vanishes in the limit. So that's kind of the thing that are suggested by this conjecture. So let's look first at the isotropic regime. And there it kind of was partially um, proven, at least the relevance of the nonlinearity. So in the isotropic regime, so again, now I want to focus on the case where Q is the identity matrix. So in this case, the nonlinearity is the gradient of H squared. Yeah. And again, we had this kind of issue that the equation is not well defined. So instead, um, sorry. So instead of this noise C, actually what you look at is certain C convolved with phi epsilon. So what is this? C convolved with phi epsilon really is a smooth approximation of the noise. Yeah, so phi, epsilon, phi is some kind of a non-negative function that integrates to one with compact support, smooth. Phi epsilon is a rescaled version of it. And it turns out that xi convolved with phi epsilon converges to xi. Yeah, so it's a smooth approximation. And so they looked at this equation, and it, however, turns out that uh, studying this equation still is a bit hard. So instead of a lambda, actually they looked at a lambda that also goes to zero at a certain rate. So if you look at the lambda of this form, so you divide by square root of log of epsilon to the minus one. Right? So if you do the quick computation in your head, square root of log epsilon to the minus one actually tends to infinity, so lambda divided by that goes to zero. So what we really have here, kind of, we try to, to bring the strength of the nonlinearity to zero. Yeah. And so what we know is that if lambda is smaller than a certain value lambda hat, which is square root of two pi, then this kind of recentered field converges to a limit, and this limit satisfies a certain linear equation. So the observation now here is that actually you can show that this H epsilon is Gaussian. Yeah, so now we can ask yourself, well, I mean, this would kind of go into this direction that the nonlinearity actually is not relevant because the limit is Gaussian again. However, what turns out is that this constant in front of the noise, which depends on lambda, tends to infinity as lambda tends to lambda hat. So in other words, if I formally would plug in here square root of two pi, then I would get an equation where this last term would be infinity, so it would be really fundamentally, diff fundamentally different from the linear equation. So actually, we don't know what it is. Yeah, and it kind of shows that even when the nonlinearity goes to zero at this rate, divided by log by square root of log of epsilon to minus one, the nonlinearity uh, still is important at least if the lambda is kind of large enough. Yeah. Okay. And kind of the main tool they use, and that's why they use Q, where that's why it comes into the game, this QC identity matrix is something that's called Kohl-Hopf transform, 
which kind of transforms this equation to a different one that is, um, is easier to treat, or that at least you have some handle on it. And uh, the same thing you can also do if dimension three or higher. So that's why Q equal to identity matrix can be standard choice. Okay, so that's the isotropic equation. Let's go to the anisotropic equation. And so remember, Wolf said that in this case, the nonlinearity probably, what is the rate at which df goes to infinity as lambda approaches the critical value? Uh, I don't remember, but I think it's kind of a linear rate. I think, I don't remember. So if somebody knows in the audience, let me know. I think it's something like one over lambda hat, what is minus lambda, something like this, but I'm not completely sure. I wouldn't bet on this. Okay. But maybe somebody in the audience knows better this result. Okay, so let's go to the anisotropic case. And uh, in this case, really, we would like to show that the nonlinearity doesn't matter, right? At least as suggested by physicists. And um, so it turns out there's a little bit of agreement about that in the physics literature. So here I'm cite a paper, a physics paper, where they did some kind of numerical simulations. And well, the punchline, the conclusion was entirely consistent with Wolf's prediction and anisotropy that involves a change in sign or the vanishing of one of the non-linearity parameters and cues a very rapid, unrelenting, and nearly immediate crossover to the edwards wilkinson fixed point. So what is edwards wilkinson is another name for stochastic heat equation, which is another name for the equation with lambda equal to zero. And the change in sign really means that, say, Q, if Q is of this form, right, then determinant being zero means that lambda one and lambda two have a different sign. Yeah. So this was kind of partially confirmed in numerical simulations. And then a little bit later in some kind of book about growth models um, was, well, confirmed again or conjectured again. So th thus is the signs of the two lambda are opposite the nonlinearity is irrelevant, and the scaling is described by the linear Edward Wilkinson equation. Yeah? And this, of course, is quite comforting because now we know at least what to prove. However, as it always turns out, um, in mathematics, uh, we're not able to treat the fully general case. So really, the model we look at is a specific Q, which is a diagonal matrix with entries one and minus one. So this would then be the equation with this nonlinearity. So you subtract the two uh, nonlinearities. And the first bad news about this is that there's no Kolhoff transform available. That's the bad news. However, there's a good news, and that's why we chose this matrix actually, is uh, that there's an explicit invariant measure, which is the so-called Gaussian free field. Those so the Gaussian this whose correlations are given by the green function of Brown motion. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, this may be. Yeah, thanks, Fabio. Thanks. So, I mean, it's not important what is exactly going for free field, but the thing is, which is important is that it's really explicit. So we can really work with this. Yeah. And so again, I mean, so this equation again is ill post. So instead of really directly looking at this equation, you kind of need to smoothen out something. And there's essentially two choices you can do. You can either rigorize the noise, Right? So then the nonlinearity becomes well defined. Or you realize the nonlinearity directly. Yeah? And that's kind of the, the, the path we chose. Um, because this doesn't affect then the environment measure. Yeah? So the equation we look at is this, so I will go slowly over it. So again, I mean the Laplace is still there, the noise is still there, but the nonlinearity is changed. So something like this. So what do we do here? So here we introduce some, a certain operator pi one. So what is pi one? So what is cutoff in Fourier space? So it simply means that if you have a certain function w, function w living on the torus of size l, well then you can look at this Fourier transform. And what the pi one does, so if you apply it to the w and you compute the Fourier transform of k, well, it essentially cuts off all Fourier modes that are larger than one. So it will be W hat K as long as K would be smaller than one. Yeah. And well, so just as a reminder, I mean, this looks quite brutal, but so we are here really on the torus of size L. 
So these k's are really essentially of this form, k divided by L. So the number of Fourier components we keep is of the order L squared, and L will be sent to infinity, among other parameters. Okay, so what do we do here? So first, here we cut off all large Fourier components. Of this, we can compute the derivative, so it's a smooth option. Then we square it. Then it turns out that of the square, there's some Fourier components that are again larger than one. So this happens when you square the, the thing. And so then we cut off again. Yeah? So in particular here, in this object, you only see Fourier components less or equal than one. And finally, H is... Uh, H is the Gaussian free field. Well, if you look at this risk again, this diffusive risk scaling under which the AKPC equation in 2D is um, invariant, does the nonlinearity really matter? I mean, it shouldn't. If we really prefer this. So that's kind of the kind of the question. And again, this H epsilon was this kind of diffusive free scaling. Yeah? So what happens if we first send the size of the torus to infinity and then epsilon to zero? I mean, it should kind of converge or should have the same behavior as the stochastic heat equation. And, and the answer is no. Yeah. So it really turns out that as epsilon tends to zero, so the large space-time behavior of the AKPZ equation uh, does not coincide with the large space-time behavior of um, the stochastic heat equation. Yeah, so something was overlooked. Yeah. And well, how can you, how can you show it? Well, if you want to show that two things are not similar, you need to kind of to fix two, you need to fix an observable and show that they behave differently in, in your two models. That's really what we did. Yeah. And one way of uh, writing down such a theorem in a not completely formal way is as follows. So if you fix the lambda positive, then the process H epsilon, so just recall H epsilon, of Tx is H of T divided by epsilon square X divided by epsilon. Yeah, so this process, even though it should be scaled in and the scaling evolves non trivially on small space time uh, and small time scales. That of the order log epsilon to the minus delta. Yeah, if you think a bit about it, as epsilon tends to zero, this turns to, to zero. So kind of as epsilon tends to zero, it kind of evolves very fast. Yeah? for some data between zero and one. And this delta actually is uniform, uh, uniformly bounded from below uh, for lambda small. So as lambda goes to zero, this delta would not go to zero. And the second thing is, when the linear equation, you would kind of expect, well, you have diffusive behavior, the correlation length of order square of t. Here, you have some kind of a correction to that, some kind of logarithmic correction to that. Yeah? So these are kind of two to observe this, you can look at that show that large space-time behaviors will really fundamentally, dif fundamentally different from the linear equation, from the SHE. Yeah. And why is this so? Well, essentially the thing is that the law of the SHE does not depend on epsilon. Yeah? So as you scale epsilon, the way, I mean, on which time scales the SHE lives does not change with epsilon. Whereas uh, for the AKPZ equation, it really depends on the choice of epsilon. Okay. Okay, so this was actually also quite a surprise for us because when we started with this project, our big goal was of course to show that as epsilon goes to zero, you see the stochastic heat equation. Maybe with um, different factors in front of the plasma and the noise, but um, yeah, it was kind of, uh, we're quite convinced that such a result can't be true. Okay, so, in the last minutes, I would like just to say something more about this theorem. So I will not completely rigorously state it because I, I don't know, five, six, seven minutes, um, but more or less say how you could formulate something like that. Yes, yes, exactly, square root of t. Yes, exactly, that's the point, that's the point. That's what you would expect. Okay, um, so what do we mean with evolves non-trivial small time scales on these time scales. 
Well, the way we formulate in the paper is a bit different from what I will present here, but still uh, rigorous. So it's essentially corollary. So with evolves non trivially on these time scales, I mean the following, if you take a test function with mean zero, with integral zero, this has something to do with the in one measure, but it doesn't really matter now. Then uniform in epsilon, if you look at this kind of uh, normalized covariance, yeah, this normalized covariance, yeah, so covariance of HD, H0 divided by the covariance of H0, H0, it turns out to be less than one for some T of this order. Yeah. And why is this now different from the linear equation? Well, I mean, the linear equation, if you choose a tiny T positive, then uh, this normalized covariance may also be less than one. That's definitely true. But the A we get, the A we get really would depend on epsilon as epsilon tends to zero would tend to one. And that's simply not true here. So the A really stays bounded away from one as epsilon tends to zero. Yeah. So it's kind of one way you can see that these two models are really different. Again, we didn't formulate like this as a main result in the, in the, uh, in the paper, but this kind of a corollary out of it. Okay. So the second thing I was mentioning is that uh, the, I was writing something about the correlation lengths. So now there's the question, how can you calculate the correlation length? Um, and here I kind of borrow an explanation of Fabio, if you want to scale. So how can you measure the correlation length? Well, if you think of Brownian motion, well, you can compute the transition probability and then you easily convince yourself that it behaves diffusively, right? But in general, maybe you're not able to pin down the transition probability. In a way to circumvent it, is to look at the bike diffusion coefficient, something that we did not invent, that was already there. And how can you, what's the interpretation of it? So if you think again of a particle, just one particle, let's forget about equations and this kind of stuff. So it's kind of moving around, yeah? So let's call this particle X, this position XT. And now you ask yourself, or oh, does this particle behave diffusively or not? Yeah? So one thing you could look at is um, at the following thing, so if you define, in this case, S of Tx is the probability, let's say here zero, particle starts at zero, that the particle starts at zero any time T is at X, right? So for running motion, you could compute it. One thing you could look at is it's such a quantity. You look some kind of um, mean square displacement, S of Tx, Tx, yeah? And if you go to diffusive, what would happen if you would divide by t, the thing would stay bounded. Yeah? And in case of bounded motion, you can convince yourself the thing does not depend on time, actually. Yeah, so it's a constant in time, which uh, is a consequence of diffusive behavior. So that's one way to, to measure the kind of correlation links, how, it's, how it spreads over time. And now what we would like to do is we would like to define kind of the same thing. So essentially, we would like to, to find a good replacement for the S for this transition probabilities. However, now we have an equation of one particle, so, well, you need to come up with something different. Well, there, of course, we borrowed from the literature. Kind of the idea is, I mean, if you look at this thing, right, then it kind of starts um, with this kind of initial condition, so it's one if x is equal to zero and zero otherwise. Yeah, and kind of you look uh, for proper replacement. And it turns out to find the proper replacement instead of looking directly at the equation, you, look, you need to look at a function of the equation. So our case. So if you look at u, which is half Laplacian of h. So half Laplacian sounds quite brutal, but uh, if you're used to calculating Fourier space, so in Fourier space, this really would mean that you multiply uh, the kth mode by k. Uh, the multiplication multiplication in Fourier space. Yeah? And it turns out that this u uh, has an inverse measure and this inverse measure is white noise. Yeah? So in particular, if you define s of tx now in this way, u of tx, u of 0, 0. Yeah, so then what really turns out that s of 0, x because the inner measures white noise is, is equal to this, and then we can essentially copy this definition. And it's a good definition because it turns out that if you do this for the linear equation, this dt would be really constant, does not depend on t. Yeah? 
cross kind of we divide by t. And uh, which is an indicator of diffusive behavior. However, our case, it turns out actually that it explodes uh, as time grows. Yeah. So in a certain sense, what we really show is kind of these two bounds. That is, as L tends to infinity, the size of the torus tends to infinity, uh, the diffusion coefficients between log t to the delta and log t to the one minus delta, which is again, fundamentally different from the SHG. Um, and I think here I would like to stop. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dirk, for the nice talk. Uh, so now uh, everybody can unmute themselves uh, to give a, a round of applause for uh, for Dirk. So thank you very much. So now let's go to the um, to the question. So. If you have some questions, you can unmute yourself and, uh, and ask them and or, or you can uh, ask, uh, ask them on the chat if you want to. Uh, I have a naive uh, question, if I may. Yes, yes. Yes. Sure, sure. Hi, Christophe. Uh, hi. So uh, hi. I, I was wondering if there is a, uh, an intuitive explanation for the super diffusivity with the log. What I have in mind is the the t to the two thirds in the KPZ case, uh, there is this intuition yeah. that the best polymer will go further away from the random walk. Mm -hmm. uh, but here, uh, is there a way to visualize that uh, the cohesion length needs to go further away? Uh, I don't know. So I, I mean, we have to, actually we have a heuristic uh, saying that delta is probably one half. Uh, so it's different from this two thirds behavior. Um, but I don't have a precise heuristic, easy heuristic explanation um, for that. I mean, so, okay, so maybe from a naive point of view, why would you expect that there is no, there's no correction term to the diffuse behavior? I mean, if you look at the nonlinearity, right, is of, of this form, and somehow you would think, well, one coordinate can't be more important than the other coordinate, so it kind of they should cancel each other out. Yeah. Um, so this should be essentially something that's very close to zero, but kind of well, it kind of turns out uh, that uh, next to the zero, which is really should be, there's some kind of a fluctuation maybe of order log t. But uh, I don't have an easy explanation. I'm not sure if uh, does that work. So you, you don't have a. A model of uh, stochastic particles that would uh, have this behavior and would be naturally related to the. No, there. Yeah, I mean, there, there, of course, there are uh, quite some. Well, there's some particle systems that uh, should be related to the AKPZ equation, uh, and um, so there's there's so-called interlaced uh, particle systems. Um, I mean, for them, this kind of behavior was not shown yet, uh, but it, of course, suggests that now we can kind of try to, to show the same behavior for, for, for these kind of discrete systems. Okay, thanks. It was a great talk. Thank you. So, Dirk, uh, so you showed that what you get is, is not uh, the additive stochastic heat equation, or at least in terms of certain observables. Do, do you get a sense as to what you what the limit is or you know how you need to modify yeah so i mean we thought about it of course um we don't really know i mean we of course we um well uh, i mean that's uh, it's not at all a conjecture but kind of what it, i mean so you would have something diffusive right i mean if you have something Laplace from H plus Xi, this would be typically diffusive. And I don't know, maybe that there's a logarithmic correction is that uh, suggests that uh, there should be some kind of correction to Laplace, and I don't know, some kind of a, like log Laplace or something like this, whatever this means. I mean, you can make sense of it, of course, in Fourier space. Then you would need to modify the noise a little bit to keep the invariant measure invariant. Uh, but we don't have a very clear conjecture what the limit really should look like. I mean, yeah. 
I mean, the next models you would maybe look at is some kind of way you have a fractional Laplacian, but uh, they have, of course, a different rescaling. And if you believe in this, that then the model should be between the model with the Laplacian to the power one and Laplacian to some power smaller than one, then there should be some kind of logarithmic correction to the Laplacian. But that's, I, I wouldn't be so bold and say that this is what I would conjecture. All right, thanks. Uh, just one other question. Uh, have you tried? you know, simulating any of these sort of things, you know, actually numerically figuring out what this delta is or you know, trying to mm. assess behavior? No, we, we didn't do any simulations. I mean, what we did, we picked up um, an old paper by Herbert Spohn, uh, where he, I don't, yeah, where he showed a certain heuristic for a certain model and uh, it turned out that, um, use some kind of mode coupling argument, it turned out that the same argument, heuristically at least, of course, applies, applies to our model, which suggests that delta should be one half. And if you look through our proof, um, the way our proof works, kind of do an iteration of upper and lower bounds. And for that, we kind of, we need to guess kind of the form of the upper and lower bounds. We can kind of see this delta equal to one and a half lurking around. But I think with our methods, we would not be able to pin down to delta equal to one half. Okay, uh, so I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. So for uh, for ASEP in dimension two, mm -hmm. Sir Yao uh, proved that um, yes. uh, that, that, that there, there there were some um, so the, the the correlation was something like the, there was a logarithmic correction was log t to the log one t to the third. And uh, so, 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 could you compare uh, your, your results with the uh, with Jaws and explain a little bit why it's, uh, it should be one half and not one third or two thirds? Like, uh... yeah. So I think to explain why it's one half, I would not be able to give this um, heuristic here. So it's uh, it's at the end of the paper, but uh, it's true that uh, for the proof, kind of we we brought some ideas of Yao. Uh, so since what um, Yao did, he, he tried to solve a certain resolvent equation, but it's not easy to solve the resolvent equation directly, so he kind of approximates this with upper and lower bounds, and does kind of iterations and uh, tries to push the iteration as far as possible to kind of to, to bring these two upper and lower bounds really close together, and uh, we, we tried to use the same idea. Kind of the difference um, what you can see is that uh, if you would look at the first iteration in Yao's paper, there you already see some kind of log t to some power correction, whereas in our case it would be something like log log t. Um, so kind of uh, we see similar behavior to what Yao does really um, for iterations that really tend, tend to infinity, uh, but not for fixed finite iterations. And, um... So, okay, so if you, um, but that's really part of the paper. I mean, if you look kind of at the iteration that we kind of guess, uh, if you could push it all the way to infinity, uh, then the upper and lower bound would really mesh and would necessarily imply that the delta is equal to one half. Whereas in uh, Yao's paper, he kind of gets a sequence of iterations, so he kind of has an equation between the upper and lower bound. And if you solve this equation, the only possible value of delta would be two thirds. Our case turns out to be one half. Okay. okay, so if there are no more questions, let's uh, let's thank uh, Dirk again. Thanks a lot. Okay, so me as a co uh, host. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, so more. Okay. Do you want to share your screen more? Yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, what is it? Hopefully it's working. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll wait a minute. Just let people settle. Sounds good.
hasn't been a minute, but anyway. Um, so I, I'll, I'll be chairing the second session and it's a pleasure to have uh, Amol Agarwal here speaking on the ferroelectric six vertex model. And as always, um, if you have questions, just put them into the uh, group chat. I'm gonna turn off the unmuting feature right now. Um, we'll try to respond to the questions or bring any uh, necessary to Amol's attention. At the end of the talk, uh, we'll allow people to ask questions uh, by unmuting themselves. And also we'll ask that everyone join together and applause for the uh, speaker. So without any further ado, uh, Amol, why don't you get started? Okay, thanks a lot uh, for the introduction invitation, Ivan. So um, let me just start by introducing what the model is. So this will be a model um, for a discrete random surface. So we'll fix some subgraph lambda of Z2. We'll let lambda, be, lambda prime be its dual. So it just consists of all the faces of, of lambda. So um, a height function F, I'll just define it to be a, a function on the dual graph of lambda. So on lambda prime, uh, such that it's integer valued. And so that for any adjacent faces, the height function differs by plus or minus one whenever uh, the two faces are adjacent. Okay, so here's an example. Um, to, to the left here, you see a square uh, domain uh, and I've filled in the faces with uh, for certain values. And uh, so this will give you a height function on this on this square domain. And as you can see, any uh, adjacent squares uh, have adjacent height values. Uh, so the one dimensional analog of this must be very familiar to everybody. It's simply a, a walk um, on Z. So I've drawn that to the right here. Uh, I have two starting points. I have a starting point, say it's equal to zero at zero, and then it's equal to some number at you know, time, um, I guess, seven. And then this height function goes up or down. So this height function, the height functions are uh, going to basically be the main topic of this talk. In one dimension, we know everything about how random height functions look. They converge to Brownian motion. They have fluctuations root n. We we can say everything we want about them. And the goal of this talk is to understand how they understand uh, how they behave in in dimension two. And this two dimensional version of the height function will exactly be the six vertex model. So let me uh, tell you where the six vertices are. So um, if I look at any four adjacent faces surrounding a vertex in uh, on the square, for example, uh, you can see that the height have six sort of local configurations in the following sense. So if I fix the bottom left square in the set of four to be H, then the other three squares around it can come in six possible configurations constrained by this uh, local adjacent, uh, by, by, by the locality of the height function, namely that the height function differs by plus minus one across adjacent squares. So there's the first one and say, I go up by one. As I go to the right, I go down by one. As I go up and then I go to H, but there, there are also five more and they're just listed here, okay? Now, uh, this, this sort of uh, interpretation is a little bit more easy, it, 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 a little bit more easy to understand if I, if I put arrows uh, corresponding to the gradients of the height function. So I'll do them according to the rules depicted uh, over here. So whenever I cross, Whenever I, I, uh, I, my height function decreases one step to the right, I'll put an arrow there. If the height function increases one step to the right, then I will not put an arrow there. And likewise, once I go up, if the height function does not increase, I, will, I mean, if it decreases by one, then I will not put any arrow there. And if the height function increases by one as I go up, I'll put an arrow between these two faces. So for example, here, I should not, I should not see an arrow I, I won't see an error any of these any of these four edges, and likewise here I will in fact see an error at all of these. Um, well, okay. So let me let me just put in the arrows, and you'll see. Okay. So as you as I said, here you see no arrows as indicated by these two rules. Here you see all arrows indicated by these two rules, and etc. So all I did here was I followed these rules, inserting the arrows in. I have six possible error configurations depending on the local gradient of the height function, and um, I'll now basically mainly concern myself with just these arrow configurations. So often I will drop the height function like that and think about uh, just how these uh, arrow configurations, just think about the arrow configurations themselves. So as you can see, maybe it's a little bit more clear after I've dropped the height function uh, that these are the six arrows, that these 
six local configurations are exactly the ones corresponding, uh, satisfying what we call spin conservation, namely the same number of arrows coming in uh, and going out. There are the same number of arrows going, coming in till vertex is going out of the vertex. And this is simply a consequence of just the curl free nature of the height function. As if I go along a loop, uh, then, um, then the height function returns to what it was. So sort of the number of increases is kind of like the number of incoming arrows and the number of decreases is like the number of outgoing arrows. So they'd better be the same. Okay, so six vertex ensemble is an assignment of uh, an arrow configuration to each vertex of the domain in such a way that they're consistent in the obvious sense. Namely, if an arrow, if a horizontal arrow exits the, the place where my mouse is right now, then it had better enter uh, the vertex adjacent to it. So, um, okay, so I can just follow these rules, these, I mean, these local rules to put in arrows on any height function, and that will give me a six vertex, uh, a six vertex ensemble. As you can see, every, every, each of these vertices are of, uh, of the six types. For example, here's an empty vertex. Here's a full vertex where all arrows enter and exit. And then you see all the intermediate vertices if you, if you just trace it, trace along the picture. So there's a bijection between, I've started with this height function, I can put in the arrows in, and then I can remove the height function. So there's actually a bijection between six vertex ensembles and height functions up to the minor caveat that I can shift everything up. I can shift the height function up by say 10, and I will still get the same six vertex ensemble. This is again, because uh, this arrow, these arrow rules were, were, were basically defined by gradients. So they can't see the overall shift. But if I mod out by that, if I ignore that small fact, or if I say pin down the height function to be zero at the origin, like I did here, then there is uh, you know, a genuine bijection between six vertex ensembles and height functions up to a global shift. Okay. So uh, this, uh, this is all deterministic for now. Uh, I wanna do probability on this. Um, on the set of height functions or six vertex ensembles. So um, we're going to do this in, this in the in the standard sort of statistical mechanical way. Uh, I have so let's pick up some, let's put down some six vertex ensemble E on some domain lambda. I'll fix some weights a1, a2, b1, b2, c1, and c2, and each of these six vertices will be assigned one of these six weights. Okay, in the way I've described here. Um, so the ensemble weight is simply, um, I mean, it's the standard thing you might imagine. It's A1 to the number of A1 vertices times A2 to the number of A2 vertices, et cetera. So this is going to give you a weight of the ensemble. And over here, I'm giving you an example. So here's an example of an ensemble and here's its weight. You can quickly check for yourself that there are eight A1 vertices uh, here, here, and there's six here, and et cetera, you can check. So, it's, so the, the contribution from A1 is going to be A1 to the eight. Uh, and then you can easily check that you know, there's seven A2 vertices, three B1 vertices, et cetera. Okay, so this gives each ensemble a weight and a probability measure will um, will assign to the ensemble is simply going to be the one that assigns any ensemble probability proportional to its weight. So I have to do W E uh, divided out by the Z where the Z is the partition function uh, designated so that this total probability is equal to one. Okay, so this is what we call the six vertex ensemble, uh, the six vertex model with these weights, A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. And it's sort of the prototypical example for our model for a discrete random surface. Okay, so um, we'll be interested. Okay, so th this model is governed, uh, the qualitative features at least of this model are governed by a parameter, which is often known as the anisotropy parameter. It's this delta here, A1, A2 plus B1, B2 minus C1, C2 over root A1, A2, B1, B2, okay. And the behaviors, at least the qualitative behaviors of this model are separated into three classes depending on delta. So there's the first one where delta is between minus one and one. And there's the second one where delta is less than minus one. And there's the third one where delta is bigger than minus one. And they're called critical, anti-ferroelectric or ferroelectric respectively. So, um, so throughout this talk, as I've written here, my main interest will be in uh, the ferroelectric model where delta is bigger than one. But I'll just very quickly, I mean, I'll never, I won't mention this again uh, for the remainder of this talk, but I'll very quickly just super fast try to tell you what happens in the, in the super, or what should happen, what's predicted to happen in the critical and anti ferroelectric phases. So in the critical um, phase, um, in the critical uh, class or critical state, every phase of the model. So phase, I'll, I'll define it a little bit later. It's, uh, I mean, it's a Gibbs measure, translation invariant Gibbs state, uh, pure state. 
all of these phases should have, uh, have the height function should converge to the Gaussian free field. Um, so this is kind of what you see like in, in loss and in tiling models, domino tilings or, or uh, loss and tilings. Um, there's been progress to this um, to this extent, at least in the order of fluctuations in the maximal entropy phase. I've written two references here. Uh, in the anti-ferroelectric regime, um, you can have localized phase, which in the dimer setting, for those of you who are familiar with it, corresponds to the gaseous phase. And again, a liquid or a GFF phase, uh, depending on the slope of the pure state, I've written down a reference here, um, that proves that result again in the maximal entropy phase. Okay, so I, again, if you, uh, this, is a, this is mainly to people familiar with these, uh, the, the behavior of dimer models is why I just very quickly described what, what happens here and here. Uh, but again, my, my main focus throughout this talk will be in the ferroelectric phase, which is when delta is bigger than one. And he, in this phase, in, the, in this regime, the model will um, will exhibit new behaviors. So these sorts of localized or gaseous phases and, and liquid GFF phases, these these are fam reasonably familiar uh, in the setting of, of Ising crystals or, or dimer models. And they're, they're Understanding how they work in the six vertex model is a very deep and important question. Um, but in this, the reason I want to focus on this talk in the ferroelectric phase is that you will see phenomena that are genuinely different from those that appear in dimers. Okay, so uh, just to quickly set up a, a normalization convention, this delta bigger than one hat, this delta bigger than one either imposes that root. I mean, just you can look at it here, actually. So there should be a two. Uh, um, so there should be a two here, uh, but okay, yeah, sorry. There should there should be a two in the denominator here, but um, right. I think there's something. In, okay, so in in my example, there seemed to be a boundary between ordered and disordered arrows. Is that related to these behaviors? So. Uh, here, I, I assume Milton, you're, you're talking about this this picture. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So there's yeah. So as Milton is saying that there's there is a there's sort of a transition here. Here you see sort of all empty arrows. Here you see all full arrows, and then there is this sort of disordered regime where you see a transition between the two. Yeah. This is very much related to. Uh, th this is actually proven to a certain extent, and I mean this is pretty much proven in the ice ice in the ice model where you see this this phase transition happening. This is very closely related to the Ar Arctic Circle phenomenon that happens in tiling models. So yeah, this is this is very much a feature that can be explicitly formulated and proven in these models. But I will not. Uh, th that will not be the main. And th that's a very interesting story. Um, but I will not. I will not talk about it in this talk. Um, anyway, so yeah, we'll assume by symmetry. Okay, so as I said, we'll be mainly interested in the ferroelectric regime. So that, that phase transition that Milton was referring to happens in the uh, critical regime. And also uh, to some extent, in, it will, it, when we'll see it in, in the ferroelectric regime it's, as well, um, in the anti-ferroelectric regime. But we'll be interested here in the, in the ferroelectric regime uh, where, um, as I said, the, we'll, we'll see some behaviors that are not visible in other random surface models such as Ising crystals or dimers. So uh, we'll assume by symmetry that A1, A2 is bigger than B1, B2 um, throughout the talk, just as a normalization convention. OK, so I just quickly wrote some slides on the physical, I mean, a quick slide here on the physical context. So this model was introduced by Pauling in 1935, who took all weights to equal one. Uh, this is the so-called ICE model. Um, and he, he was using it to model the what's known as the residual entropy of ice through the free energy of the six vertex model, which is I mean, um, the limit of one over n, I mean, so yes, the limit of z to the one over n squared as n goes to infinity, where z is, as, as, as I uh, remind you, the partition function for the model. So you propose the, like a, sort of a three line heuristic, which I won't go through. Uh, it's very, very quick. And he, he, I'm pretty sure that he knew that this wouldn't really give you the exact answer, but he proposed a quick heuristic as to why you might expect F to be about three halves. Now, the stunning phenomenon, though, is that um, numerical experiments. So, as I said, this is 1936 and this is 1935, but those are publication dates. Actually, these experiments came prior to the uh, to Pulling's work. Uh, found that the residual entropy is 1.52, so super close to to what Pulling had um, 
would predicted 1.5, um, which is perhaps one of the, I mean, the, the sheer accuracy of this, of this prediction is possibly one of the reasons why people got so excited about the six vertex model. So anyway, uh, this is for the case when the weights are equal to one where Pauling was trying to model ice, but actually the other weights have physical value as well. As I mentioned here, a few years later, Slater used the six vertex model in the ferroelectric regime to model a KDPU crystal. So this is, um, it's commonly used in, in fiber optics, but okay. But uh, this, is, this, is not a, this is not a worthless crystal. It's actually useful in, in real life, but let me not explain why. Um, anyway, so, um, so it actually took a while for people to, to pin down the true value of F. It's 1.54-ish and more precisely four thirds to the three halves. This was discovered by Lieb in 1967. So also very close to the experiment to the experimental value. And Sutherland, Young and Young um, in 1967, soon after Lieb's work extended this free, um, free energy calculation to arbitrary vertex weights. But I'll be interested in, so this is all for the free energy or for the partition function. My main goal is to understand how the height function actually looks to understand the geometry of the height function. Okay, so um, on, sorry, I, I would like to understand the geometry of this height function on large or even infinite domains. Mainly I'll be interested in infinite domains in this talk. So um, now the problem with trying to do this, trying to understand how this model looks on an infinite domain is that once lambda is infinite, once the size of lambda is infinity, then these weights make no sense, right? The weights are, I mean, the weight of an ensemble is the product of the weights of its vertices. But once I have infinitely many vertices, this weight is most likely either going to be infinite or zero. So it's, it's no good. So what one does instead is consider as Gibbs states, which uh, is a standard, a standard notion in this context. So very quickly, what a Gibbs state is, is I have some six vertex, I wanna know, um, the probability distribution of some six vertex ensemble lambda on some maybe infinite domain, uh, sorry, six vertex ensemble E on some maybe infinite domain lambda. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut out some finite subdomain lambda prime of lambda, which is sort of depicted here in this dashed box. And I'm gonna sample this E on the whole of lambda under, on the whole of, of lambda. And then I'm just gonna cut out what happens in this box condition on everything that, ha that happens outside of this box. Okay, so then if I sort of condition on everything that happens outside of this box, what I'm left inside of this box is, is just a finite six vertex ensemble with some boundary conditions dictated by whatever's going on outside of the box. And um, we say that mu satisfies the Gibbs property if uh, basically on the inside of this box, it looks like a, a six vertex model. So the probability that the restriction of E to the interior of this box is some, uh, some fixed six vertex ensemble F condition on everything outside of the box is proportional to the weight of F. And now the weight of F is of course well-defined because I'm, because everything is finite. Okay, so this is the notion of a Gibbs measure. It's just the con just conditional on any finite subdomain. I have a six vertex ensemble. Okay, so in principle, I would like to understand Gibbs measures now. These are the analogs of, of, of the, um, Analyzing this, I mean, this is this is the, this is how one will analyze the six vertex ensemble on a, on an infinite domain. Uh, now the problem is that there's sort of too many Gibbs measures, and they are many of them are not particularly physical. So um, what we'll do is we'll often uh, restrict ourselves to uh, a subfamily of Gibbs measures, which are more physically natural, uh, by imposing two conditions. The first is translation invariance. So this is, I mean, this is the definition is, is sort of what one might expect. It's invariant under translation. So if I shift the lattice by, by one, then the, uh, the, the, the measure is invariant. And the second is extremality, which means that um, if I can never decompose my measure as a sum of, as a non-trivial sum of two measures, so if mu is equal to some non-trivial linear combination of mu one and mu two, then mu one, mu two, and mu all have to be equal to each other. Okay, so the translation invariance you can imagine is sort of physical. I mean, if I imagine these as molecules on a very tiny domain, then uh, if I just shift, if I just shift my like microscope by one molecule, then I shouldn't see much of a of a phenomenal of a phenomenological difference. The extremality, though, why you would impose that is a little bit more subtle, and I won't go into that. Um, in any case, though, uh, I can make a definition at least that a translation invariant extremal Gibbs measure is what we call a pure state. And now, so now our game is to understand what are all possible pure states of the six vertex model and how do they behave? 
Okay, so associated with any pure state is a slope, st, um, which is in zero, one squared. So what s refers to is the probability of a given edge being occupied, of a given vertical edge being occupied by an arrow. And the t tells you what the probability of a horizontal edge is of being occupied by an arrow. So for example, if st is one, one, then all edges, then I have all sorts, then my model is, then, um, all edges of the model are occupied. And if ST is say one zero, then only the vertical edges are occupied and none of the horizontal arrows are occupied. But uh, once I have, you know, I mean, of course those are the boring phases, the interesting ones are the ones that are in the interior of the square. So I should mention that under this notation, the geometric sort of slope of the surface is actually one minus two S two T minus one. So when I say geometric slope, remember I had this height function for the, for the model. Uh, so I can sort of, this height function, you know, I can plot it and it will look like a surface. So uh, if I have, if I, if my S is, um, S corresponds to a vertical arrow. So if my, so a vertical arrow, whenever I have a vertical arrow, the height function drops by one. So, so I have like sort of a minus S corresponding to the presence of a vertical arrow and a plus one for every probability one minus S corresponding to the absence of a vertical arrow. So the sum of those is one minus S minus S which is one minus two S. So that's sort of the average gradient of the X direction. Likewise, the average gradient in the Y direction is uh, two T minus one. So the sort of the slope of the model is one minus two S, two T minus one. But I prefer to, to view these slopes as in zero one squared. I mean, they just differ by the geometric slope by an affine shift. Anyway, so um, so it's a theorem of, of, of uh, Sheffield going back to 2003, almost 20 years by this point, that for what are known as gradient models under simply attractive um, Gibbs potentials. And this is a, a reasonably wide ranging class of statistical mechanical models. There's a unique pure state of any slope. So at least the, the first question is what are all the possible pure states? For this class of models, this result answers the question that, that says that for any pure state, there is a unique, sorry, for any slope in this box, there is exactly one pure state. Now the problem is that this does not apply to the model I'm talking about right now because this ferroelectric six vertex model is not simply attractive. And what we'll see is that there's this, this, uh, this, this theorem is actually not quite true for the ferroelectric six vertex model. So my next slide will give you a sort of a plot for how these different slopes, for what are the slopes and how they look in this model. Okay, so this is a prediction in the physics literature that goes back to uh, about 25 years ago by Buckman and, and Shore. So, um, so here is the, the square, zero, one, and each point you should view as a potential ST that might, get, that might or might not give you a pure state. So um, as you can see, there are four sort of regimes here. There's, this, there's the border of the square. Uh, there's this white region. There is this red region, which is sort of bounded by two blue curves, okay? And the model will exhibit different behaviors depending on which color you're in. So the first is actually, uh, a non-existent re non-existence regime that that actually in the simply attractive case does not exist. So in the ferroelectric six vertex model, you see this region here bounded by these two blue curves, for which no pure states are believed to exist. On the curves themselves, uh, a pure state should exist, the unique one, and it will exhibit uh, so-called. I mean, it will exhibit KPZ Carter Appreciation Zhang uh, behavior, one-dimensional Carter Appreciation Zhang uh, behavior of the type that Dirk had mentioned in this previous talk. Outside of this um, sort of lens, uh, the model should be liquid and it should exhibit Gaussian free field or root log n fluctuations. And in this green box, on the, on the boundary of the green box, it should be frozen so that the pure states are basically deterministic. So the green box is, I mean, the, I mean, the green part is basically trivial. I mean, once you have, um, once, I mean, the green box, I mean, the, the boundary of the green box basically means that you're setting S or T equal to zero or one. So as you can think that basically freezes all vertical edges, for example, to be occupied or unoccupied. So, I mean, the, froze, the, the fact that the whole model is basically deterministic on this boundary here should not be particularly surprising, but the remainder um, is non-trivial. And I should mention that so the liquid regime where the model exhibits Gaussian free field or root log n fluctuations is one that one often sees in the context of dimer models or Ising crystals. But these regions of non-existence, these non-trivial recent regions of non-existence, as well as these KPZ states are 
sort of the new phenomena that appear in this six vertex model. Um, so my goal of this talk will essentially be to, uh, to explain these regions in more detail and per, these, this red and this blue, these new regions in more detail and to describe theorems that can prove them exactly. Okay, so I mean, in a sense, basically the non-existence in the KPZ states will be the results of this talk. The frozen states are trivial and the liquid states are still open. Okay, so uh, before I do that, let me just say that this, these curves are parameterized precisely in the, in the physics literature. Uh, there is a precise prediction for them. They're given by hyperbola. I've, I've written down the equation here. I mean, it's not entirely important exactly what it is. So this is the hyperbola that bounds the, uh, the lens. It's, it's a union of hyperbolas that bounds this lens here. So all I'm trying to say here is that there is an exact prediction for, for how this lens looks, how this forbidden region looks. Okay, so let me state some theorems now. Uh, so the first is that, okay, I'll always assume, um, I'll fix, I'm fixing my weights A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, and C2. I'm assuming that delta is bigger than one so that I'm in the ferroelectric electric regime. And I'm also assuming by symmetry, I mean, it's not very important that A1, A2 is bigger than B1, B2. I mean, you can easily flip this if you wanted. Um, okay, so the first theorem is that if I am inside the hyperbola, so if ST, so H you should view as the lens, this red region is H. So if ST is in strictly inside of H, is inside the, you know, the interior of H, then there is no pure state of slope ST for the ferroelectric vertex model. So that proves the, um, the non-existence regime. And if ST is on the boundary of H, so that's these blue curves here, then there is a unique pure state uh, for, the six for the six vertex model. So that tells you um, at least that they exist. Now the question is how do they behave? And the, I'll state this result more precisely very soon, but uh, the theorem will be that if I'm on the boundary of this lens, then this pure states will exhibit KPZ high fluctuations. So I'll try to describe how those look very soon. Uh, but for now, you can, uh, I'll, I'll just mention that systems in this KPZ class are typically distinguished. Uh, so I should say the one dimensional KPZ class are typically distinguished by having five height uh, fluctuations of order n to the one third instead of the typical n to the one half that you see in diffusive models such as Brownian motion. Okay, so I will try to now explain what, um, what the second theorem looks like in more precision. So uh, just to remind you of the setup, I have my weights, which are ferroelectric. I'm just assuming by symmetry, this, this A1, A2 bigger than B1, B2 assumption is simply by symmetry. I'll um, suppose I have some, sorry, I should have some ST on the boundary of H. So in this blue region, the purported KPZ region, uh, and I'll sample some six vertex ensemble on Z2 from this pure state mu ST. I'll denote it. So any, as I had mentioned earlier in the talk, any height function has a, any six vertex ensemble has a height function associated with it. So I'll take this random six vertex ensemble. I'll let its height function be H. And as I said, it's a height function up to uh, an overall shift, right? So I'll just pin down the shift by, by fixing the height function to be zero at the origin. Okay. So um, as I said before, this, once I've looked, once I'm looking at this, six vertex ensemble at this pure state of slope st, I know the average slope of the height function. Uh, it's one minus two s comma one minus two t. So the expectation of the height function at any point x comma y will be one minus two s times x plus two t minus one times y. Okay, and now the question is how does it fluctuate around that expectation? So here's a theorem. So uh, there exists explicit constants um, omega in d. Uh, which are dependent on everything in the game. So dependent on all, all six weights and on the S and the T. So that, um, so, okay. So here in this parenthesis is H of X omega X and uh, the expectation of X omega X. So omega is fixed here. So you should view this as probing the height function along some line, okay? So that's what I'm doing here. So I'm looking at the height function along this line, Y is equal to omega X. We call this the characteristic line. Um, and I'm looking at its height fluctuations along this characteristic line. So the statement is first is twofold here. First of all, the height fluctuations are of order um, x to the one third, as one sees here. Um, and after I normalize by that, the probability that this fluctuation is bigger than some value z after appropriate rescaling. So z, d is like some variance you can imagine. It's just some constant that, that comes out of rescaling. 
this the probability that the height function uh, fluctuates by x to the one third times z is given by this function phi, which we call the bike range distribution. Uh, it's known as the bike range distribution. So I mean, basically the statement is that as if I probe the height function along a specific characteristic line, the height fluctuations are of order n to the one third and their bike range. Um, and off this characteristic line, it will turn, off, turn out that the height, function, the height fluctuations are sort of trivial. They're, they're Gaussian and of order n to the one half. So Brownian motion style. Okay, so um, I've just given a sort of schematic here. I've only I've only drawn it in the quadrant, but of course one could extend it to the full plane. Um, I have this orange line, which is this characteristic line, y is equal to omega x, and along the line, the high, uh, the high fluctuations are order x to the one third, and they're bike reigns. And off everywhere off the line, they're order x to the one half that are Gaussian. So as you can see, this is a very anisotropic behavior for the um, for for the high fluctuations. I mean, it's not. It's not conformally invariant, like what one sees in dimers. And in fact, it's not even rotationally invariant in the sense that um, every, all the action happens. I mean, the interesting action happens along a single line and everywhere else you see Gaussianity. Uh, I see there's another point in the chat. Um, so a naive question, how, how, how fluctuations can be different along a certain line for a translation invariant Gibbs state. Well, I mean, so, uh, okay, I should say that, um, uh, so keep in mind here that I've pinned down the height function to be zero at the origin, okay? So what one should really be doing is one should be taking two points and analyzing their height difference and then looking at the fluctuations of that. So the statement for that will be that if, if, if the line connecting those two points is parallel to this characteristic line, then one sees these different fluctuations, these, these KPZ fluctuations. So once I've taken, yeah, okay, good. Okay, I see that answer to the question. Yeah, so the confusion here might be because I pinned down the high function to be, to be zero at the origin. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, right. So, um, okay, so there's no uh, definitional contradiction here. <laughs> okay, um, so good, so right, so as I said, um, along directions parallel to this characteristic line, I see height function. I see height fluctuations of order x to the one third and Gaussian. But along all other directions, I see uh, sorry and, and bike reigns. But along every, all other directions, I see the exponent one half and Gaussian. So one can also analyze uh, the two point function for this model, which is I, I'll just say that um, let chi v denote the the indicator that a vertical uh, a given vertical edge um, a, a vertical arrow exits from some vertex V. So I pick some vertex V, chi V denotes the indicator function for the existence that, of a vertical edge exiting from this uh, vertex V. And I'll let SUV denote the covariance of these chi. So it's like this sort of the spin-spin correlator. Um, uh, so it's expectation of chi U, expect, uh, chi V minus S squared. And S squared is the expectation of chi U times expectation of chi V. So of course this will this will decorrelate as you might expect from an extreme or, or ergodic measure, uh, but they decorrelate in an interesting way. Once again, if u minus v is parallel to this characteristic line, then the decorrelation decay will be power law. It'll be u minus v uh, to the minus two thirds with an x. So the exponent here is two thirds. But if if u minus v is not parallel to the characteristic line, then the height uh, then this two point function will decay exponentially, as indicated here. So uh, one more point I would like to mention before uh, proceeding is that this two-point function in dimer models one often sees, or, or random matrix models, for example, one often sees repulsion, right? If, if you have a dimer in one, in one point, then uh, you've reduced the chance that you'll see a dimer right next to it. But here it's the opposite. You actually see attractivity in the sense that this two-point function is always non-negative. So I've um, I've told you that this convergence this is to some mysterious law called the bike range distribution. Um, I'll just quickly, I mean, okay, I won't go through the slide in, in total detail, but very quickly, uh, what the bike range distribution is is you solve uh, the hastings MacLeod solution of the Penlevé two equation with certain boundary conditions. I'll set v to be some functional of the solution uh, written here, and the bike range distribution is described to be this object. Okay, it's described to be some it's some explicit function in terms of the, the hastings macleod solution to the Penlevé 2 equation. So one might, to those familiar with random matrix theory, one might realize that this is sort of familiar 
Uh, this looks somewhat familiar to the Tracy Woodham distribution. Uh, so what one has to do to get the Tracy Woodham distribution is remove the prefactor here. So it, this this should just be one in the Tracy Woodham setting. And I think one also has to remove the um, the v if I remember correctly. Um, or, right. Um, so that would that would give you more or less the Tracy Woodham the Tracy Woodham law. So this is sort of a more complicated sister of the Tracy Woodham law. But even though it's more complicated, it's universal in the sense that it's universally believed to describe fluctuations for stochastic models, stationary stochastic models in the in the KBZ universality class. Uh, so ASAP, for example, stationary ASAP will exhibit uh, bike range fluctuations. Okay, so what I want to do next is sort of describe um, a little bit about a little bit more about this pure state. Um, so that this pure state, this 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 interesting pure state, will come from uh, the stochastic six vertex model. Okay, so this is a certain specialization. Uh, so this is an a priori specialization of uh, the six vertex model where I pin the weights down in a certain way, but then there will be sort of a gauge transformation that allows you to extend this pure state to any arbitrary ferroelectric uh, pure state. So, um, so the weights for the for the model are uh, written here. So I pin, so I, I, the empty and the full arrow configurations are both given weight one. Um, and these the, sort of the vertical and the horizontal are given weights B1 and B2 respectively. And these corner states are given weights one minus B1 and one minus B2. And the pattern here is that if I fix the, the, the collection of incoming arrows, the sum of the weights of all possible um, vertices with those incoming arrows is equal to one. So for example, here, I mean, there's only one arrow configuration that doesn't have any incoming arrows. So that has weight one. And likewise, there's only one arrow configuration that has both edges occupied by incoming arrows. So that also has weight one. But here I see two vertices, the, the third and the fifth that have an incoming vertical arrow. So the sum of those is equal to one. And likewise, the third, the fourth and the sixth, the sum of those is equal to one. So this enables, um, the reason for these weights, um, for this choice of weights, is that it enables a sort of a row by row Markovian sampling procedure for the six vertex for this, uh, for the model on say the quadrant, where this y axis is indexing time and this x axis is indexing states or um, space. So how that works is that I pick, I, I, I look at the bottommost row and I pick the leftmost vertex in the bottommost row. So this one our cursor is right now. I see one incoming horizontal arrow. So I know that this arrow has to either go forward or it has to go up. So I flip a coin with probability B2, it goes up and with uh, forward and with probability one minus B2, it goes up. Let's say I, I, I flipped up. So this arrow goes up here. So I go to the next leftmost point in the row, which is here. And as I can see, there is a vertical arrow, which must either go up or to the right. So once again, I flip my coin with probability B1, it goes up. With probability one minus B1, it goes to the right. Let's say it goes right, and then I iterate. And then it looks like that. So this is how one row of the six of the stochastic six vertex model is sampled, and then I can keep on going. Okay. So in this way, it sort of exhibits a, a Markovian sampling procedure. So I know that there are maybe some other pe some people in this talk who are more familiar, who are very familiar with interacting particle systems. Um, so I will just mention a quick link between this model and the the asymmetric simple exclusion process. So Dirk had mentioned this in. This previous talk, I can mention the CISEP instead of the ASEP. Uh, so one places particles on the lattice in such a way that at most one particle occupies any given site and particles will jump to the left and to the right according to exponential clocks to the left with rate L and to the right with rate R such that jumps to uh, occupied sites are, are suppressed. Um, so once I've imposed R is greater than L, that's the asymmetry I'm forcing a drift to the right. And this is sort of an archetypal model for non-equilibrium stochastic transport. Um, so the stochastic six vertex model is very closely related to the ASAP. There's in fact a limit transition that turns the stochastic six vertex model to the ASAP. And to understand that, um, let me first uh, set B1 and B2 equal to zero. So that means that pads can't go up and they can't go horizontally. So they have to sort of zigzag in the sense that only corners are allowed and the full, the full and empty vertices are allowed. So what that means is that any path has to move diagonally or, or sort of zigzag in the sense that once this path moves vertically up, it can't go vertically up again or else that would give rise to this forbidden weight. So it has to go right, but then it can't go right again because of this forbidden vertex and therefore it has to go up. And so it zigzags like that. So all paths have to zigzag. So if I view um, 
uh, so I can, let, let's suppose I, I, I view um, the y-axis as time once again, and I'll view an arrow as exiting from a site as a particle, okay? So for example, there's a particle over here and a particle over here, but no particle over here. Uh, then the whole model is gonna be invariant under a diagonal reference frame. So if I sort of, so as, as I said, all paths are deterministically going along this diagonal, but if I shift my reference frame by uh, looking at site X minus T instead of at site X, then everything, uh, then all the particles are staying stationary. They're not moving over time. So that's boring. In order to see the ASAP, I have to make um, these weights not equal to zero, not these B1 and B2 weights not equal to zero, but equal, but very small. So I'll set B1 equal to epsilon L and B2 equal to epsilon R for some very small epsilon and R. So now usually paths, and now, I mean, not much has changed here if epsilon is very small, right? Usually paths will go diagonally just as before. So usually I will see all everything constant under our diagonal reference frame, but every so often um, a path will jump one uh, twice to the right or a path will uh, go twice up. So under this diagonal reference frame, the double right, I mean, the sort of double right jump will correspond to a particle jumping to the right. And every double up movement of the path will correspond to a particle jumping upward uh, to, the to, to the left. So this L is basically corresponding to a particle, um, to a left jump of the particle and the R is corresponding to a right jump of the particle. So if I let epsilon tend to zero and I scale up time by epsilon inverse, I get the ASAP. I mean, the sequence of Bernoulli's will give me an exponential clock. So that will give me uh, the ASAP. Okay, so this is the connection between the stochastic six vertex model and the ASAP. And in fact, many phenomena that are known for the ASAP, hydrodynamical limit shapes, KBZ fluctuations, et cetera, are also true for the stochastic six vertex model. So what you know for the ASAP can often be sort of transferred to the stochastic six vertex model. Okay, so I've defined the stochastic six vertex model, uh, but of course this has very specific weights. And I wanna say, I wanna, I wanna turn these weights, I wanna sort of, uh, my, my next goal will be to, explain how the stochastic vertex model is, is basically related through a gauge transformation to a generic ferroelectric six vertex model. So the first thing I should notice is that let's suppose I've, um, I take a six vertex, I, I take some domain lambda here and I'm fixing now some boundary conditions. Okay, so I fix some boundary data on lambda. And there's a series of conserved quantities. The reverse one is what I call M1. It's equal to the sum of the numbers of the A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, and C2 vertices. This is obviously invariant because it's simply given by the number of, of vertices in lambda. Okay, now um, M2 is another conserved quantity. It's two times a, I mean, okay, I've written it down here, I won't, won't say it. And this is equal to the total number of vertical arrows. So this, once I've, okay, so uh, if I don't fix the boundary conditions, this is not fixed. But if I do fix the boundary conditions, then this is actually, this is actually fixed because I, once I fix the boundary conditions, you can sort of convince yourself that you know exactly how many vertical arrows had better exist in the model. Likewise, I know how many horizontal arrows had better exist in the model, uh, which is what I call M3. And there's this M4, which is sort of the winding, uh, the total winding of the paths, which is also fixed by the boundary data. So these are four conserved quantities that once I have the boundary, once I fix the boundary data are, are completely fixed to the model. So what I can do now is I can sort of multiply um, I can multiply the probability of any, uh, um, I can multiply the, the probability of the weight of any state by quantities dependent on M1, M2, M3, and M4, and that will not change the Gibbs property. So as I said before, this M1, M2, M3, and M4, they are, um, they only depend on the, on the boundary conditions. So if I say, if I multiply R, if I, if I multiply R for every A1, so I'm multiplying, for okay, right. So R, so everything is color coded here. So hopefully it's sort of explanatory. Um, but um, what I'm doing here is I'm multiplying R, I'm multiplying the weight of a state by R to the M1, X to the M2, Y to the M3, and Z to the M4. So what that does here is that that picks every every one of these A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, and C2 weights, and multiplies it by R. For the, for, for M2, I I multiply x squared for every a2 weight, x squared for every b2 weight, and x for every, x for every c1 and c2 weight. And likewise here, I'll, I'll, I'll do the same for m3 and m4. So um, 
that's a, a, a transformation of these weights, but it, it still satisfies, I mean, the point of this transformation is that it still satisfies the Gibbs property for the A1, A2, B1, B, for the original model after this transformation. And the reason is, is, is fairly straightforward. It's that the Gibbs property, uh, remember it, it, conditioned on the boundary, it, it conditioned on the boundary data. So once that boundary data is fixed, these four quantities are fixed. So the weight of the ensemble under the original uh, boundary condition, uh, so under, under the original, this original, the model with the original weights was this quantity here, the product of the A's, B's, C's, and D's. And I'm free to multiply that by a constant factor, which is constant now because of the fixed boundary conditions. So I'm multiplying up by R to the M1, X to the M2, Y to the M3, Z to the M4. And then I can distribute these in the sort of obvious way described here. Uh, and that will give me now, now what I see here is a six vertex weight uh, under this gauged model, the slightly transformed model. Now, the point of doing all of that is that if I have generic weights, A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, and C2 uh, for the ferroelectric six vertex model, I can pick these gauge transfer, uh, these, these gauge parameters, X or X, Y, and Z to sort of make the stochasticize the model, make it stochastic. So I have, as you can see, I have six parameters from um, for the six vertex model. I have four gauge parameters, so I can, rig, I can rig them up in such a way that my model only has two parameters, which is the stochastic model. So I've written down um, what these B1 and B2 corresponds to here um, in terms of the original weights. So you can, the claim is that you can pick R, X, Y, and Z so that the original model become, turns weights, the original model weights turn into these weights here with B1 and B2 um, given explicitly by these equations. And observe that I have a square of delta squared minus one, which is what imposes me to, to pick deltas bigger than one. So the upshot of all this is that if I have a ferroelectric six vertex model, I can always gauge it to a stochastic six vertex, to a stochastic six vertex model. So now, um, so now I will want to explain how this, um, how this, uh, what those Gibbs measures look for the stochastic model. And then I'll, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll end there. Um, so how do I sample a state, uh, a Gibbs measure for the stochastic model? Um, so I'll consider the stochastic six vertex model in this quadrant, um, Z2, um, Z, uh, on, on the positive quadrant here, and I'll fix some boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions are, are that I have um, sites on the y-axis are independently entrance sites for paths with probability row one, and sites on the x-axis are independently entrance sites for paths with probability row two. So um, I'll call that boundary data row one, row two, Bernoulli initial data, okay? So I'll fix some parameters that only depend on B1 and B2. It's not very important what they are. Uh, so I mean, I've written them, them, them down explicitly. Kappa is one minus B1 over one minus B2. And this phi is some explicit. Phi is some function. Phi of Z is some function um, uh, of Z that depends on Kappa. So the claim now is that if, if rho one is equal to phi of rho two, then this double-sided Bernoulli initial data is in fact stationary in the following sense that if I cut out a subquadrant of this quadrant and I look at how paths are entering along the subquadrant and I forget everything outside the subquadrant. So I have this quadrant here and I've cut out a subquadrant here. Then paths enter along it again, according to double-sided row one, row two Bernoulli initial data in the sense that again, paths enter the, through, the, through the vertical boundary with probability row one, which is phi of row two, and enter through the horizontal boundary with probability row two. Uh, so this property is in fact false if row one is not equal to row two. So, um, and it's this property that allows that, that this is, as you can see, this is basically a translation of brain's property. I mean, this is telling you that the model, that this, this, this boundary condition is translation invariant under the semi-group uh, Z greater than zero squared. Right, yeah. So this is now, okay, the problem with this is that this is only a boundary, uh, this is only a pure state on the, the quadrant. But if I want to extend it to the full plane, I can do that in a rather straightforward manner. I can take uh, this, this uh, sort of row one, this phi of row, row Bernoulli profile, and I can shift it down to minus NN. So I'll let mu N of row denote the shift of my original double-sided Bernoulli measure 
by this by down by n and to the left by n. And then this translation very, I mean, the stationary property I described before tells me that the original um, that this shifting process is sort of consistent in the sense that if I if I shift down by n and I shift down by m, then the mu m is the restriction of this mu n whenever um, m is less than n, basically. So what this tells me is that I can shift this measure down and down and down, and the limit is well defined. Okay, so I'll call mu of rho this uh, this limit as I shift my measure down to the uh, you know, down uh, to negative infinity, common negative infinity. So what this is telling me is that this mu of rho is now okay. So now so now this this is a, a pure state defined on the full lattice, and uh, it's a pure state of slope rho. Uh, uh, Phi of rho. And the reason it has this specific slope is again just due to the fact that, as you can see here, a probability of a vertical arrow being occupied as rho, and the probability of a horizontal be arrow being occupied is, is phi of rho. So now I've defined here a pure state for um, for uh, the the B1, B2 stochastic six vertex model. But again, now I have my gauge transformation that I described before. So this pure state is not only a pure state for this stochastic model, but it's actually a pure state for um, uh, for any ferroelectric six vertex model. So again, by picking, if I if I let's say, let's suppose that I start out with some ferroelectric weights a one a two b one b two c one and c two, I can pick b one b two through the gauge equivalents I described before. I um, and I I describe I, I use this sort of sampling procedure to sample a um, um, a Gibbs state on on the full lattice for for this measure. But then by the, the gauge property, I've in fact managed to, to, to provide uh, a translation invariant Gibbs measure for the six vertex model for the original A1, A2, B1, B2, and C1, C2 weights. Now this condition that the slope, uh, the slope satisfies this sort of T is equal to rho of S is exactly going to correspond under this gauge equivalence, the statement that um, ST is on the boundary, that sort of blue region I described before. So this is sort of a way to sample, to explicitly sample any Pure, any sort of KBZ state of the ferroelectric six vertex model. And I should say that this is actually useful for determining local probabilities. You can, if I want to determine local correlation functions, I can use a sampling procedure to actually compute things. Um, and it's also useful for showing this attractivity property I described before. So I guess I, I'm, I'm running short on time. So um, um, I guess this, uh, Right, so the height fluctuation theorem I described before, this KBZ fluctuation theorem, it was actually proven originally uh, for the stochastic model. And then it's extended to the, to the, uh, to the general ferroelectric six vertex model through the gauge transformation I described before. Uh, and the proof is basically algebraic. It's based on the integrability of the stochastic six vertex model. So my last few slides were, trying, were going to explain, just outline the proofs of these non-existence regimes, but I think I'm, I'm out of time. So let me just summarize. So, um, so the summary is that uh, we had a phase diagram for this uh, ferroelectric six vertex pure states. Uh, there's this non-existence regime, there's a KPZ regime, there's a liquid regime, and there's a frozen regime. This is what the physicists had predicted. And the, the first two are sort of novel in the sense that uh, the non-existence and the KPZ regimes don't appear in several models such as dimers. Um, and then we, what we, we, we can actually prove is that these, uh, these new phases uh, the sort of new phenomena, we, we can prove that these new phenomena exist for this uh, stochastic six vertex model. So um, basically, and the reason for this KBZ phase is more or less due to the fact that you can um, exist, uh, the, the, more or less due to the existence of a stochastic model that can be compared to the original one. Uh, that's how you can sample these pure states and understand how they look like. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. So everyone should be able to unmute themselves. And let's all uh, let's all thank them all for his talk. So uh, we do have time for any questions. If people want to, they can just unmute themselves and ask. Um. I have a small one, yeah. I'm sorry if I may. Um, I was trying to understand the, the phase, uh, the ST parameters where you don't have a existence of a pure state. Uh, 
Right, yes, yeah, so there's a revolution, uh, yeah. I, I was trying to imagine uh, if you would want to take a, an infinite volume limit of this uh, six vertex model. Yeah, on say the cylinder, for example, or our tower on the torus. Uh, uh, I had in mind uh, on, on a huge square yeah, sure, yeah. on which you would try to, 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 to prepare a certain slope and then let that square go to infinity. Yeah, yeah. So what's yes. going to happen is that yes, you're going to ask what's going to happen if you try to do that, right? So I was I was thinking maybe there would be some kind of jump when we would interpolate. Uh, so so this non-existence in the middle, I would, but maybe this is not the case. But I was imagining that uh, maybe you could prepare things below your square in the uh, in the bottom of your square and then uh, change continuously the boundary condition on the huge square and and see how the the, the the Gibbs state would look in the middle. And in order for this non-existence phase to exist, it would need to sort of jump. Yeah. Uh, is it what is happening or? Uh, yeah, 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 okay, okay, okay. So, okay, right, yeah, so that's a good question. So one, okay, so let me see if I understood your question correctly. So you take a big, you take a huge square and you yes. try to, impose boundary conditions on the square so that they, they live in this in this red region. Then you're asking, how can it possibly be that there is no pure state in this in this red region? Well, what would have to happen is that you sort of see a, a jump in the profile in, in the um, in, in the profile, right? So um, yeah, so that that is sort of what happened. Well, okay, yeah, so that, that, that is sort of what happens. I'm not sure if anyone wrote down the, the proof carefully, but for the stochastic six vertex model, one could try to do something like that. And um, one could actually do something like um, take the stochastic model, this on a quadrant um, with slope in the interior of this, of this lens. And one will indeed see sort of a, a coexistence regime where you have this sort of line separating two phases of different slopes. And those two slopes will actually be on, 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 these, um, on these blue curves. So you will see a, Sort of a phase separation between slopes happening on these blue curves. Yeah. Mm, okay. 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 Great. Thanks. Yeah. Great talk. Thank you. So, related to Christopher's question, so um, can you understand that this this uh, this discontinuity in the same way? Uh, as one understands the discontinuity in the asset when yeah, it's sort of like same. a shock. Yeah, it's sort of like a shock. Yeah, okay. this this continues something like a shock in the ASAP. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the, you can say that the reason for this, um, actually, the reason for this this lens can also be traced back to the ASAP itself. The ASAP has asymmetric large deviations, right? I mean, the probability of a high current is like e to the minus t squared. A probability of a low current is like e to the minus t because you can um, fix a like a sort of slow bond happening, and this red region is sort of corresponding to the the, the low current regime of, of, of the ASAP. So a lot of the intuition for, for why these faces appear is closely related to your intuition for the ASAP. Thank you. Other question? Okay. So if not, let's uh, all thank uh, Amal and Dirk uh, as well for both of their talks today. And as usual, we'll have a, another seminar in a week. Uh, so if you want to join together once more. See you all in a week.